so we're, we're going to kick things off. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Ryan, this is Mike. Uh, we work for the Rimble team at Consensus. And we're going to be talking today about transaction states, and specifically the UX of transaction states. We don't have much time to go into uh, what Rimble is right now, but if you're interested, scan the QR code, and go to our website, or follow the link. Um, I guess to set the scene of why we're talking about this today, um, our main user group are developers in the space. We build components and write guides to try and help DAP development uh, get quicker and, and sort of improve UX at that level. Um, so we speak to a lot of developers, we uh, do a lot of research, a lot of interviews, and something that came up sort of again and again um, as a pain point for developers was, was transaction states and how to design them effectively. So instead of wanting to sort of theorize around what might potentially make good transaction state UX, um, we thought we'd try and sort of uncover the secret to transaction UX um, by rolling across leaves, getting our hands dirty, and going out to the field, doing some research labs design. And this kind of reminded me, you know, getting out to the field, the hands dirty, of a childhood hero of mine. Uh, and there's no big beef for guessing who that might be. It's Indiana Jones. Uh, so we're going to use Indy to sort of help us uh, talk through some of the main problems around transaction UX. So first up, no ETH, no transaction. So what happens if a user trusts to transact but doesn't have the required funds? Um, how do we help users get ETH and how do we educate them on, on why it's needed? And these fee, uh, the fact that you need ETH to pay for fees can leave a bit of taste. And although transaction fees might be normal to you or I, um, this is something that's quite often unexpected and a little unsettling for new users. Transactions can drag, so compared to the sort of Web2 experiences we're used to, um, when a transaction might take sort of minutes, hours, even days, um, how can we help communicate what's happening to users? And on that note, how much should we actually explain about what's happening? How much should we be explaining about why it's taking that extra time? How much of the blockchain in general should we be showing to the users and how much should we leave behind the scenes? Cherry on, the, uh, cherry on top of the cake is that of course they're irreversible. So um, that's quite scary, especially for new users. Um, if something goes wrong, there's no chance to uh, you know, call customer service, get things changed. And we don't want that leading to transaction regret or even worse, Ethereum regret. Uh, regret where people end up leaving the ecosystem and sort of giving up altogether. And this leads to an interesting sort of dilemma we come across quite often around the notion of education. So this dilemma of, do users know what they're doing? And if, if uh, they don't know what they're doing, are they incentivized sufficiently to go and sort of educate themselves and make their best, uh, their, their best effort at it? So that's some of the main problems, and we completely understand why um, you know, this is such a sort of big issue and such a pain point. But I think it's important to also talk about the opportunities for sort of spending more time on de designing transaction states. And hopefully this will convince uh, any teams out there to maybe sort of pick this up as a priority after they leave a sucker. So first up, we talk a little, about, a little bit about some of the behavioural science uh, sort of uh, justification for things of this. So first up is the halo effect. Um, so that's if it's horribly complicated to set up an account for a service, and that bad user experience will rub off on people's expectations for the rest of the service. Now this quote references account creation, but you can certainly sub in transactions and it still has the exact same meaning. So if your user is exposed to um, it's so a really bad uh, you know, copy like this, for example, that doesn't really explain what to do, why you need to unlock a token to sell it, have this sort of quite confusing um, approval function in the wallet. Um, it's going to create a bad experience even if you know, your DAP has the, the coolest tech out there, if it has um, the smoothest connecting, uh, connecting the wallet experience. I think a great analogy for this is the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull movie, um, which you know, uh, one bad movie has tarnished the reputation of an entire franchise. The peak end rule is very similar, so this is a cognitive bias that impacts how people remember past events. So these intense positive or negative moments, e.g. the peaks, 
And the final moments of an experience at the end are heavy weighted in our mental calculus. Transactions are doubly important here. They quite often represent the sort of end part of an experience with a DAP. Um, and again, they also have a very high likelihood of being either an intense positive or an intense negative experience. So again, this could really sort of, again, if you have the nicest DAP leading up to the transaction, then it's going to really impact the sort of how a user remembers your DAP and erode that sort of trust that you might have fostered up until that point. I'm going to shit on this movie again, but that fridge scene coming at the end of the, uh, well, sorry, that movie coming at the end of the franchise has certainly tarnished that for me. <laughs> okay, I'm nearly done. Right. Users don't tr even trust Web2 either. So, in a study conducted by Baymard Institute in 2018 for Amazon, they found that 28% of users abandoned their task because of complicated checkout UX. Now, that study also found that the main reasons for that abandonment was an overuse of jargon and a lack of visual design. And I think at the moment, obviously in this experimental phase of Ethereum and dApps, um, this is quite often the case in, uh, in Web3 applications as well. So, again, a really good opportunity to sort of spend some more time thinking about the design of transactions and make that, reduce that abandonment and increase that trust in your app. Okay, so we've spoken about some of the problems, um, talked about some of the opportunities. We're going to show you a quick demo uh, in a minute. This has sort of come out of the sort of research and the design exploration that I mentioned earlier. We spent the last two months speaking to um, some savvy blockchain users, some not so savvy, to try and understand what it, that secret source to transaction UX might be. Um, just to caveat slightly, we focus mainly on you know, dApps that might be trying to um, appeal to a more mainstream audience and try and reach that sort of uh, outside of this, this bubble that we kind of operate in. Um, so the demo is for potentially a DevCon application where you might be able to purchase your tickets as NFTs. So Mike's going to talk us through that. So like Grant said, we build a lot of demos for user testing. Um, for this one, we're using Open Zeppelin's ERC721 contracts. We're using Truffle for the contract uh, management and deployment. And then on the client side, we're using Drizzle to keep the blockchain data in sync with the client side. And uh, we're using our own component system, Ripple UI, and some Web3 components that we built just to keep things uh, easy and fast for us to build. And then we're extending Drizzle with third-party data that comes from uh, just regular API services. We're using ETH Gas Station's API to get a gas estimate that we can use to calculate a transaction fee and an estimated wait time based on just like what the average price of gas is going to be right now. So we're using those two kind of key important uh, pieces of information on the UI here. The transaction fee is what we're calling it instead of talking about gas. And we're estimating that just based on like what method the contract's calling and the average price of gas at the time. And then same for the uh, estimated wait time. We can just kind of see how long uh, transactions are taking at a set gas price. And uh, we're just assuming things, and we're, we're just kind of guessing for the most part. Obviously, users can change uh, how much gas they're paying for transaction, but just giving that expectation up front is really helpful. So I'm walking through like a quick diagram of also like another technique that we're using here, which is like trying to keep Web3 away from the user as long as possible. Uh, we don't want to hit somebody right off the bat with a connect dialog, or we don't want to minimize functionality of the dev until like they've done some sort of proof that they are on chain or they're, they're connected to blockchain. So once the user has expressed an intention, that's when we start doing our pre-flight checks for making sure they're on like a modern browser, that they have a connected wallet, um, that they're on the right network. Once we're sure like those things are good, we can check their balance. We can run a simulation on the call that they're doing to get that transaction fee. Then we can check their balance and make sure that they're gonna have enough money for what they're trying to buy and the transaction fee, and then we can give them steps right there to even like prevent them from even starting a transaction that we know is not going to work. Um, so once we have all that, we'll give them uh, not relying on the wallet UX is also like something that we're big believers in. So we want to show the user uh, before or right at the time of the transaction like as much of that information as possible. So 
once we've given all that data over to the user, they can make the informed decision to be confident that what they're doing is actually going to work and it's going to work the way that they expect it to. And then they have an idea of how long it's going to take. Um, so we'll just go through the end and it's basically like, they'll get, they'll get errors along the way if there's any problems that'll help them remedy. And then we find, find, finish it up with a summary of the transaction details that tell them exactly how much it costs and like where they can get more information, either linked to Etherscan or OpenSea or something like that. Thanks. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into sort of some of the more actionable tips that came out of uh, this research and this uh, uh, demo. So I think the first lesson that we sort of we came up with um, was to not rely too much on Wallet UX. A lot of dApps out there um, sort of think, oh, you know, the wallet can handle the transaction. We just need to get the user up to that point. Um, the issue here is that wallets can't be specific. They're naturally designed for lots of different use cases. Um, within the DAP itself, you can talk much more clearly about the sort of the task at hand that the user is trying to achieve, which should help reduce the sort of cognitive load on the user. Um, so, for example, we talk about the fact that once the transaction started, um, it's the process of the ticket being sent rather than just a sort of generic your transaction is pending or in progress. Um, this is specifically important um, for error messages. Um, to you might be familiar with seeing sort of. Um, you know, just generic insufficient balance messages in some of the wallets you might use. Um, this doesn't really help new users or less confident users actually help, uh, sorry, uh, get back on track with what they're trying to do. Um, that assumes a lot of pre-existing knowledge, which not all users are going to have. So again, within your DAP, you need to be able to make, you need to make that effort in order to help users uh, get past this uh, obstacle and talk again in context of what the user's trying to do. So. Um, you're not having enough transaction fees in order to pay for your ticket in this instance. Second lesson is around prevention. So we spoke previously um, about the irreversibility of blockchain transactions. So it's super important to be sort of anticipating and designing for these sort of uh, end user errors that might occur. So that could be like passive UI, such as the, the indications in the top right corner about the wallet the user's using their balances so they don't try and transact with an empty wallet. Um, but it also might be, you know, actually intentionally designing some friction into this process. So kind of, a, uh, it's weird to say this because we're quite often told to be reducing friction, re reducing friction, reducing clicks, reducing the nature of the reversibility. Um, we felt it was important to give the user this like final opportunity to double check everything written in a language that they understand compared to uh, a wallet which will be more technical and less specific to what they're doing. Um, and we actually feel this is like, yeah, a super important way um, that a user can check that everything's correct and they can be 100% confident transacting. Thirdly is to set user expectations. Um, so I guess the main places you want to set expectations here are around uh, fees and time. So again, on this sort of checkout screen, um, we reference the, uh, the transaction fee and the time. Um, I think it's important to reference the fee before the wallet. Again, um, this prevents it from feeling a bit like a, a hidden fee, which might end up eroding trust in your DAP. Um, and I think a lot of the users we spoke to didn't have really great knowledge of what the transaction fee was. So again, it gives you an opportunity to sort of give that sort of explanation for users that don't understand. Um, there seems to be quite a general misconception that transaction fees go to the DAP uh, teams themselves instead of the network, which obviously isn't going to help um, their understanding what's going on. Um, also, the estimated wait time. So Mike explained how, how we sort of go about providing that to the user. And I think that's really important that although users may not mind uh, the wait, they don't like uh, being left in a sort of limbo where they're not sure how long it's going to take. Um, so I think it's really important to provide this information up front so they can better plan what they might want to do next, whether that's going off to complete other tasks um, or sit and wait and watch the transaction go through. The most important thing we want to do is give us a ballpark figure at least so that um, instead of just a sort of a, a static message or like a spinner, um, as we uh, we heard that some users felt uh, or thought that meant their transaction may be timed out, that could obviously result in the user trying to initiate the transaction again, which we also don't want to do to happen that will incur another transaction fee cost, or an error. 
Lesson four um, is to provide just enough feedback. Um, and I think that the message here mainly is just because you can get that information from the blockchain, just because you can sort of poll and find out when the transaction's in the mempool and it's being mined, that doesn't mean the user wants to know that, or at least doesn't means the user doesn't want to know that in that way. So if we liken this experience that we demoed to like if you purchased a movie on know, Amazon or something, you purchase it, it gets downloaded from the cloud into your uh, onto your device. Now you don't get a play-by-play -play of exactly where that content is in the sort of the journey that it takes down to your device. Um, and that's because a user just wants to know, okay, has that process started? Is it happening as expected? And when it's finished, essentially. And we found that a lot of users that we sort of put this in front of, you know, didn't sit and watch the transactions go through anyway. So it's kind of redundant to waste time, uh, you know, crafting those messages about when the transactions left the mempool, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, um, design for next steps. So we talk a lot in Web2 about the post-purchase experience. Um, that's not as applicable in, in Web3 necessarily, where we have uh, you know, less you know, marketing channels where you might have like, success confirmation emails. So I think the, transact um, the transaction success message is like a really uh, good opportunity to, um, to do that. Um, and in order to design a successful post-purchase experience, you really need to know what the actual end goal that your, that your user has. So for example, in our demo, the end goal wasn't to just complete that transaction, the end goal was to go to the conference. So this message is crafted in a way that it explains to the user what they need to do once the ticket's met their wallet. Um, it also anticipates that the user may have been buying the ticket on behalf of a friend or colleague. So again, you give this springboard um, button at the bottom here, which is like, gift your ticket. So you're anticipating what the user might want to do next and helping them achieve that problem. Again, assuming they have the knowledge to be able to go into their wallet send the NFT to a friend or, or colleague. And I think this is a really good opportunity to support the ecosystem more widely. A lot of dApps out there have interoperability in mind. So for example, if your dApp allowed you a user to generate DAI, for example, let's not just have a message that's okay, this great, you've got your DAI. Why don't we say, great, you've got your DAI, go learn interest on that at Compound. There's a really good opportunity to sort of uh, cross-pollinate, I guess, users between the dApps uh, out there. You know, we're all working towards a similar vision here. Yeah. I'm just going to ha hand back over to Mike in just a sec. I can't believe you saw my desktop while I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> um, so a lot of this doesn't sound too novel, might all sound quite familiar, and I think that's the case. We don't necessarily need to be reinventing the design or the UX wheel for Web3. I think we might just need a bit of a collective nudge to sort of remember some of the lessons we're already familiar with in Web2. Um, so I'm just going to hard pass over to Mike to talk a bit about what some more technological advancements in space currently uh, might mean for transaction UX. So we went through traditional transactions and all that being said, like it's great that we put time and energy into figuring this stuff out, but Honestly, if you can get away with not dealing with these problems, that's the best design solution. So if you can abstract gas away, if you can get rid of transaction fees, um, if you can make transactions happen faster and that's within your capabilities, absolutely do that. So meta transactions is one example where you can just pay the gas on behalf of your users. Um, something like the gas station network or the meta transaction relay that lets you um, pay for users' gas would get rid of one of the pr problems and friction points. Uh, layer two solutions, uh, side chains, child, plasma chains, like Bloom and POA, they're great, they're fast. Uh, they have really, really basically free transaction fees. Um, so again, you're, you're not having to even deal with the whole transaction issue. Um, design with the developers from the very beginning. So when you're architecting your smart contracts, use a proxy pattern that lets you chain multiple steps together into a single transaction for the end user. Um, there's future things coming, state channels, ZK starts, that will also let you do things off chain. Um, if you, again, if you have the ability and the time and the, and the skill to get rid of transactions from even happening, that's, that's the best way to deal with transactions. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our advice belongs in the museum. Um, so just to recap, um, 
So I think the overarching heuristics and the sort of the foundation behind all this advice is still very much um, still very much applies. And that's to always communicate with context, be specific about what the user is doing, the task that they're trying to achieve. Plan for errors, um, anticipate errors, design error states, um, help users out of the jam, don't just tell them that it's, that it's happening. Set the user expectations, so always try and keep them in the loop, make sure that they're aware of any sort of nasty spot, potentially nasty surprises such as fees or long wait times. Um, provide just enough information, just because you can provide the content doesn't mean that you should. Try and think about the, the actual information the user needs at the time in order to progress through whatever journey or flow you're designing. And remember next steps, you know, try and avoid dead ends. We don't want the user um, to be sort of, okay, great, well, but I'm lost, I don't know what to do next. So consider next steps um, whenever you're designing a, a flow, there's probably another step afterwards. And that's it, again, if you're interested in finding more about Rimball, scan the QR code, there's, there's our Twitter. Um, thank you.